right oh, good now. morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let's start our first session of the uh, live case from Asan Medical Center. Jian, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear? Good morning. I'm Dr. Han from Seoul National University Hospital. Oh, hi. Hi. Good. I um, could you? Uh, uh, Can you I'd hear? I'd like to int introduce my neighbor. Co-chairman Dr. Chang from Severance Hospital. Oh, Dr. Chang, hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you again. Yeah, nice to see you. Yes. Uh, what's going to next? With the, uh, so we're going to introduce so, our patient. So we are it, we are yes, ready you, to to go, and uh, I think we will ask Dr. Who's uh, Dr. Dr. Chang. Dr. Yeah. Chang. Okay. Uh, we'll present the the case. Uh, a summary. Yeah, I'm Dr. Gang of uh, the Medical Center, and I will introduce our patient. The patient is 82-year-old male and admitted with dyssemial insertion of Nihar grade 3, started about a year ago. He had a history of hypertension and diabetes, and about two years ago, he visited our hospital, and he treated with PCI on proximal LAD and RSA. At that time, the chronic total occlusion of cell complex artery was checked. And recently, the echocardiography showed severe AS and mild LBC sort of dysfunction. Next slide. Uh, his demographic characteristics, he has hypertension and diabetes, and ST score is 4.6. 4. And next. And as I mentioned, the you know, patient has chronic total occlusion of the complex artery, so a kinase of imperial posterior wall was checked, and the ejection fraction was 46% and severe AS was checked, and mild AR and moderate MR was noted. And uh, you know, recently the coronary CT was showed the patent stent. Next. From now on, our CT interpreter, Dr. Gang, will introduce our CT result. Yes, I'm Dr. Do Yun Gang, and I will interpret the result of the cardiac CT. The iliac and femoral arteries were heavily calcified and show significant luminal stenosis with uh, minimal diameter 3.7 millimeters and 5.3 millimeters, which was not suitable for transfemoral tapping. So we decided to undergo transapical tapping. Uh, there were three calcified cusps, and the area of the annulus was 535 square millimeters, and the mean annulus diameter was about 26 millimeters. Uh, the area of sinus valsalva was 918 square millimeters, and the ratio of sinus to annulus was 1.7. The amount of calcium was 210 cubic millimeters, which is under the below uh, the average. Uh, this is the patient sizing chart for Safi and XT. Uh, I recommend 29 millimeter size Safi and XT valve with underfilling uh, about 3 cc. Uh, the height of the coronary arteries are sufficient, and I recommend the 5 degrees of LAO and 12 degrees of caudal view for discriminating the individual cusps. Uh, and the location of the LV apex is just behind the sixth rib, and the angle between LV long axis and LV OT is about 60 degrees. Uh, how do you about think? Uh, uh, how do you think about this, there, Dr. Jianyi? Dr. Kim, you want to introduce the other team? Uh, just mm -hmm. mentioned. Okay. Uh, here we have Dr. Ye, you know, and Professor mm -hmm. Su is just beside of me. And I'm Junbom Kim. And here, Dr. Yang. Cardiologist. Yeah, cardiologist. And Dr. Kim, our cardiothoracic fellow. And Dr. N is, of course, standing beside us. And then there's many other team members here. So uh, I just want to show this slide here. On the, uh, can we, the, the CT is on the screen. So you can see this, uh, this uh, patient, uh, a little challenge, a couple of challenges. One is the uh, apical axis. You can see there the, the apical actually is very median to the median uh, uh, midline. And, uh, Rib space are pretty small, so that's the one thing that we, we have to look at before the transapical approach. Of course, we always can access, but at least you know the a little challenge in this uh, uh, apical access. And the second slide, second the CT slide, oh. next one. So this patient is uh, ventricle is pretty small, and for the transapical approach. Uh, 
uh, when the ventricle is a little bit small, that's a little bit challenge because a, the distance is probably not that long because we do need to put a sheet in at least a million, two, two centimeters. So you need a walking uh, distance. And it, this slice, I just want to show you the angle from the apex to the aortic valve is quite a short, uh, the, the, uh, significant angle there. A majority, in majority patient, there's a pretty straight, uh, straight line from apex to the, to the aortic valve. But this patient, as you can see, the uh, quite angulation there. And in terms of size, this is the air valve area is a five, uh, 530 uh, square centimeter. Any comments uh, from a uh, from a panel or the moderate? We have decided to choose a 29 uh, valve because this is right at the low low end of the the range of the 29 valve. So we are planning to reduce uh, by 3 cc. Uh, two or two, three cc. That's a, that's a usually is a, is, a, is a range because of the the size we want to reduce to a diameter probably is about 27 uh, millimeter. So bigger than 26, but there's a less than 29 valve. And the valve is not extremely calcified. Uh, they have some leaf with calcium, but not uh, much calcium in the mitral annulus. So we don't want to reduce it too much, and it may cause a pedal leak. And this valve, basically, I don't think there's a uh, major risk for the annulus rupture. So that's also the good thing uh, uh, for, for us. Any comments from the uh, from panel in terms of sizing? Valve choice? Hello? Hi, Jen. Uh, Jimmy Hon, Singapore. Yeah, hi. Hi, Jen. I, I think I will agree with you that, uh, that oversizing is uh, absolutely spot on. Looking at the CT data, most of the calcium distribution is on the leaflet rather than on the uh, aortic root. Right. So I think r rupture risk in this particular case is probably pretty low. And uh, that amount of oversizing, I would uh, fully agree. The amount of underfilling, you, you mentioned 3 cc. It's not something that we are, um, uh, in Singapore, we are uh, accustomed to. But I'll be very interested to hear your comments on what sort of under, uh, underfilling of the balloon do you normally recommend in this sort of uh, oversizing uh, cases? I, based on my, the, my previous experience, like a 29 valve, if you reduce by uh, 3 cc, usually the diameter goes down to the about 27 uh, seven, uh, uh, millimeter. So that's the, the I wanted. But if you really want to oversize a little more, I think by 2 cc in this uh, particular uh, situation, I think it was also fine because uh, the valve is not really calcified. So as I say, there's no uh, risk for rupture. But if it's a, it's a, this valve is extremely calcified, I would definitely reduce by 3 cc. Uh, I, my current approach, actually, I like to reduce the volume a little more uh, to start. And then it's easy to increase the slice because I don't want to oversize it too much and cause uh, uh, annulus rupture. Even like a, without calcification, if you stretch too much, I think there's a small risk for the aortic root uh, abs, uh, like a, a hematoma or this kind of situation. So uh, knock wood, I don't have a, any annulus uh, ruptured so far over the past 11 years. So that's my approach. I usually uh, downsize a little more, and then uh, if needed, I can increase, this, uh, increase the volume. Thank you. OK. okay. If no, no question, I think we are, we'll, we'll start. So for the, because for the time, I already opened the chest, and then the small uh, left, uh, can you see the screen? Uh, the left uh, minister academy, and the suture already uh, in place, but I don't think there's a camera here. You probably have it. Uh, can you see it? Yeah. OK, yes, so we can. Uh, basically, I use it, uh, two large pressure. It's a U-shaped suture. So, uh, use a big needle. You have to use a big needle, like an MH needle, in order to do this uh, 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 suturing. But if you use a pull string uh, suture, as a true pull string suture, uh, I use a SH needle, just regular uh, needle. Uh, but uh, uh, my approach is to use uh, two large uh, pledges on uh, each suture, the two suture. OK, so the happening already given, and the uh, femoral vein, the femoral uh, artery already in, uh, in place, the, the, the sheath. And, uh, uh, the angle, projection angle, is, uh, is uh, determined by CT. So we did an aerogram, and we can show the aerogram, and it looks pretty good uh, on the uh, projection angle. Okay, so 
if everything's uh, okay, we start. The needle. Needle. Can I have the needle? Can I have the needle? Kevin, the needle and the, uh, okay, and uh, just the uh, J tip, why? So during the apical approach, the puncture is actually quite as critical. You make sure the puncture side is, uh, is in the center of each uh, suture. I uh, think it's very crit critical because you don't know when the, the muscle spread, you don't know which direction. So you're trying to keep it uh, at center as possible. And the guide one. Okay, when you see the blood come out, and then I use uh, just a regular, regular J, J tip Y, it's uh, like a central line. Okay, can I flow low? So when you advance J uh, Y, you have to see the uh, flow low because uh, there's a potential risk to push through the uh, mitral codes, and that will be a cause major problem. So I always uh, advance slowly and uh, watch the flow low. Make sure the tip there's no bending. If anything bended or the curved, that means that you you potentially uh, capture the something. So you can see this. Uh, Pass is pretty good, but we're trying to pass the aortic valve. Usually, it shouldn't be any problems, but uh, you know, never know. Okay, so this is pretty good. So I want to the echo. It's very critical to show the long axis LVOT uh, view to look at the uh, the guide wire. Just make sure, double sure, that the, the guide wire not through the mitral codes. Okay, can we assure the LVOT, long access view. So you can see the guide wire there against the uh, uh, septum and the mitral valves are uh, completely free. So I'm pretty sure this, uh, this wire is fine. Okay? So I will take the needle out and I need to uh, use this six or uh, seven French. Shaking. I've never shaken. Okay. okay, so that uh, I think this is six, seven French, right? I just push it all the way through the aortic valve. Now I transfer, uh, so switch to the uh, actual stiff one. So in the majority case, I don't use uh, use uh, uh, GRY to uh, like a uh, guided wire through the uh, aortic arch. I usually bend a little bit. So just show this, I uh, banded the tip a little bit. You can see it. Just to help pass the aortic arch. Okay, so flow low. Okay, we need the arch. Uh, we'll see any luck to pass today. Sometimes it uh, looks like we, we don't have luck. I don't want to. Okay, if uh, I don't want to poke too much, uh, but uh, to save the time, I will use a GR diagnosis. You can see the aortic arch is pretty calcified. Sometimes they do have a problem to pass the guide wire. Okay, uh, flow low. So pull the guide wire a little back. Okay, pull back a little bit. Pull, pull wide, guide wire. Okay, that's good. Okay, so now this is the arch. I think it will be go down to distal. Okay, so now I can advance the guide wire. I usually park uh, the, the distal wire will be a diaphragm level. Go ahead. Yeah, that's good enough. Okay, we can remove the GI catheter. Good. Section. 
Okay, uh, where was she? Uh, no, 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 I didn't take it. Cast it out. Okay. Okay, so uh, well, so the critical for this uh, inserted sheet is uh, don't push in right away. So I usually is uh, quite a vigorous lo uh, rotated and at once. The reason is if you push harder through it and the muscle will spread it, it probably spread it more than you need it. So when the, when you put the sheets into the ventricle, will bleeding around the sheets. So you're very important to rotate. It the sheets and then, then the, the uh, one advancing. So this uh, patient, the heart chamber is pretty small, so I will probably only two centimeter, and then I will take the guide wire, the dilator out. Okay. So right now it's about three centimeter in the ventricle. Okay, so uh, whether you need a balloon or not, uh, I, nowadays I don't use uh, BAB anymore for the transapical. Uh, the reason is uh, it's always easy to uh, through, the, through the aortic valve integrate So I usually don't do the uh, BAB anymore. So I think we will skip, uh, everybody's okay? We'll skip uh, BAB? Okay. So I just want you to uh, see the screen, so it's uh, also important that you can see that the, the, the uh, sheaths, uh, no, that's, uh, that's just, uh, yeah, the sheaths to the aortic valve right now is pretty nicely, uh, the angle is pretty nice. So I can, I just show you how to uh, adjust the sheaths. It's really easy to adjust. So you can, if you want to push the guide way down, you just lift it, see, you can push it and make it more uh, coaxial. But, Sometimes if you want to push it down, you just uh, uh, turn the, your, your sheet. So that's why transapical, the advantage is really you can control the guide wire pretty well. Okay, so we have a valve ready. So it's also important to, to make sure the valve orientation is uh, corrected, because uh, even like uh, we do it for 10 years, sometimes we still find a, you know, a, a mistake, the valve may be upside down. That will be a, you know, embarrassing complications. Uh, so it's very critical, the operator, you always check it before you insert the, the, the valve. So make sure that the, the non-cuffed, the, uh, the side is, uh, will be the outflow and the inflow will be cuffed. That's a, that's a really critical. Okay, so we can insert it. Just push it hard, just push it quick. That's bleeding, push it, push it. Yeah, okay, so this is the in. And then, that's good. So generally speaking, you need to push in a little bit and then the DLing. DLing is very simple. You just push the, push the two button and then the DL. So the DL, you don't need to spend too much uh, DLing because uh, air in the upside of the sheet is really no problem because the positive pressure never get into the, uh, to the body. So only the tip, uh, the in, uh, at the tip, the air have to be removed. So you can see what the ones uh, we have. Okay, you can just pull the guide wire, tie the guide wire a little bit. Okay, so the, you can see the valves now is outside the sheet. So once the, the valve outside sheet, I usually pull the push back. Okay, and the lock it. Okay, so basically we are ready for positioning. And before positioning, just make sure your coaxial is okay or not. Right now, it's not a perfect coaxial, so I'm going to adjust my sheets a little bit, push the guide wire down. You can see it on the screen. My sheets are towards the bottom of the heart, so the guide wire is more now, is more coaxial to the aortic valve. And the pacing, pacemaker is ready. We are setting 180. 
and the pressures looks good, 100. That should be checked. So make sure every team is ready. So uh, I'm going to bloom very, very slow. So initially, pardon? Oh, so yeah, you should uh, angle. I saw that you already set up. That's a good point. We usually set up. OK, so I need a mag. One more mag, because I only need to see the aortic valve and my tip. Maybe one more mag. I don't need too much. OK, so when you the mag, you really can see the calcification. That's how I really want to see it. OK, so everybody ready? OK, pressure is good. So I'm going to position the valve. So make sure the coaxial is, is good. So you can see that the, the either my tip was pushing too much, the coaxial is not great, so I returned my cheese. So the valve is not the perfect uh, coaxial right now. And, it, and we can uh, give a little bit uh, contrast to see. So you, you see uh, I usually position about 70% above the annulus and 30 below the annulus because this valve intend to move down when the inf uh, initial inflation. So I'm going to make an adjustment. My sheaths probably need a little pullback because the two, two marker on the push, uh, the, 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 the caster is not outside of the mark. So this marker should be uh, outside the sheath. So that's pretty good now. OK, so we are going to pacing. OK, and then a contrast to look at it again. And then for so posi positions, what? So the sequence will be, uh, everybody, we're going to where the blood pressure is. OK, we're going to uh, pacing, contrast. If uh, level, no, 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 we're just, we're just go through that everybody will know. OK, we're pacing and contrast. And then the uh, uh, position is good, and the pigtails are out. And then inflate the balloon very slow, OK? And I will make a final adjustment. And then the balloon all the way up. And then, OK? OK, so ready? Pacing on. OK, contrast. Good, I think that's good to start. OK, the pigtail out. OK, start the inflation. Slowly. OK, go. Go, 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 go. All the way. Blown down. And pacing off. And blown out. OK, push the Y. So keep the Y in the center. And then we look at the TE now. OK, so the guard was still in the uh, inside of the valve. So they may have some central leak. But uh, we may, mainly we want to look at the pedal valve leak, any pedal valve leak. So on the TE, you can see the uh, valve position is pretty nicely right at the mitral hinge point. So on the long axis, I don't see any leak. Uh, we can go to the short axis. So there's a little bit of tiny leak at the, a little bit. So in that situation, uh, we either can be blown or just leave, but I think I will do a balloon. Uh, I want to be a little perfect. So before the balloon, it's important. This just for the, you know, I think uh, for the uh, teaching purpose. So before the balloon, you always need to do the aortogram. Make sure the valve position is good. So I'm going to do an aortogram. We can make a mag on the screen. So don't do balloon if you don't know the position. So it's very critical. OK, so we can uh, put the pigtail down a little bit. Not too, too, too low. Yeah, that's good. OK, we do an aortogram. So we are not looking for any leaking or anything. I just want to see the position. So the position is actually perfect. So on the end, it's very low uh, leak. But I think uh, we either leave or we can do a balloon. For the balloon, I don't do the increase of uh, uh, volume. So I use the same volume to balloon again. The reason is that when you reduce the volume, 
uh, initially, the valve may not uh, completely uh, like uh, expand it, and sometimes it may recoil a little bit. So it's better to do just the same uh, balloon again with the same volume. Okay, so we'll do it. Uh, if we can uh, push the pressure slider high, we can uh, increase the pressure a little bit. Do we have a time? We have time? Okay. Okay, if we have time, we do it. But in the real situation, this kind of situation, basically you, you can stop it, don't do anything, or you do a balloon again. But I think uh, I will do a balloon just for the reduce this uh, parallel leak a little bit. It's a very mild parallel leak. Okay, so before I do the balloon, I like to pressure slightly high because right now it's a 90, so going up. Okay, so we are, okay, flow low. Okay. Okay, so I will, balloons are usually still a little bit low in the ventricle side because I will more on the ventricle side rather than the uh, aortic side, okay? So pacemaker ready? Oh, my, my sheath is too deep. Sorry, I need to pull sheath back. Always look at the marker. Okay, so, okay. Pacing on. Okay, balloon up. All the way up. Hold it there for, see, you, you can see the valve expand a little bit. Okay. Blown down, pacing off, and blown out. So you can see the, the, the same blown, same volume and the valve expand a little bit. So each time you reduce the volume, if you reduce the volume more, and there's a more chance the valve may not fully expand it. So you do the same, but don't increase the volume the first time because there's a risk for, 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 for over uh, expansion. So okay, now we can look at the uh, echo. I'm pretty sure that the, the leak is gone. Can go short access. I think a very minimal. Any comments? Very good result. We don't see uh, very much PVL at all. Very little, I think, uh, very, like a little, tiny. Mm, very tiny. Yeah. yeah. So the position, is, uh, is, I think, is great. I intended to uh, position the slider high instead of low. And also, they can reduce uh, pacemaker rate. So I think it looks good, pretty good. So I was going to take a guide a while. OK, under flow low. So make sure there's no resistance. So when you take a guide wire, you always watch the flow low. If a high resistance, you may need to protect the valve. But this, uh, this is fine. So just pull, pull back into the sheet. OK, so can we have a CM up? And if everybody wants to see the apex, is any bleeding or not, then I think uh, that's a good chance to, <laughs> to see any problems. OK. So usually it's not much bleeding. The whole case is actually a very minimal bleeding, generally speaking. Okay, so we are. So before the she's out, I want to pressure down to the hundred. So we need to reduce the pressure. There's a two way can do. One, you can pacing. Uh, the pacing is not the rapid pacing, just the V pacing. Start a hundred and then increase the uh, rate until the pressure down to the uh, 90 to 100. But another thing is that we just ask uh, Anista to do it. So we just wait. If we don't want, looks good, the pressure down to 108. Okay, so we'll snare. Can you the, the push it down? And this one we also the snare. Okay, so 105, that's good. So we can take it out. Go ahead. So I don't tile right away, just clip it. So I just want to show the apex. So there's no reason to rush to tie the suture. So you just snare down and then look at it. There's any leak. So you can see this, uh, this apex looks great. There's no leak. And uh, make sure the pressure is right now is a little bit low. And then I can tie the right. OK, cut the suture a little bit.
Okay, put a finger down there. Just press this uh, paget. Yeah. Squat my finger. So I use a sliding. As always, use a sliding. First one, you don't need to care. Second one, pull down. Third one, still pull down. Okay. Fourth one, sliding. Until it's not the back, and then you lock it. Okay. Okay, see this? And this is one. Cut it. Usually, no leak after one uh, suture is uh, tight. And then you tie the second one. Okay, I think the both of the sutures are tight. So I don't give a protamine before the apical hemostasis is, uh, is uh, confirmed. Because just in case you are bleeding, you need to go on the bypass. So you don't want to reverse the happening right away. So we look at the apex. And, Gian, yeah? Any, any comment from panelists? Okay. Any question from? Okay. So, Jan, uh, this is Kentaro. Hi. Congratulations on your excellent result. And Thank uh, you. I have one question. Okay. Could you please explain about the uh, puncture site? Some people like the uh, puncture at the true apex, and some people like the uh, puncture at the little bit anterior side uh -huh. of the apex. So which do you like? That's a good question. So uh, I think the true apex is, a, is a usually a good alignment to the aortic valve. But the problem is the risk is, uh, is for, the, uh, for the suturing because the apex is usually fatty and also thin. So it's a quite high chance to have an apical problem bleeding. So generally speaking, I don't like to uh, suture on the true apex. It usually is a little bit anterior uh, to the apex and just beside the LAD. So important that you see the LAD fat pad and then you just uh, left side of the fat pad and near the apex. That's probably the best area for the, for, for the suturing. And as you, I demonstrated, really not important to you find the, the, the spot right like a, uh, uh, straight to the aortic valve because you can adjust the sheath, adjust the guide wire, and then to make a very nice uh, coaxial. So that's why I don't think it's very critical. Uh, the most important to you have a solid muscle for the suturing. That's the most important for the transapical. So don't worry about the angulation. Uh, you will get it with a with a with a sheath. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, we are do the final okay. uh, angle. We have one okay. more question from panel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is a journey. Hello. Uh, actually, I've seen some. Purging of apex after this procedure. Could you tell us the uh, late result of the apical area after this procedure? Like uh, the bleeding after the procedure? No, no, I mean there's some purging, enlargement of apex. Oh, okay. It is not, not, not aneurysm, but something like enlargement and different from before. Uh, actually, we are, we are really not experienced this kind of situation. Uh, really early, like the first year, we did, did see some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, pseudo aneurysm. But I don't think we have uh, any concern about, about uh, the uh, aneurysmal change. We didn't see it. Unless, uh, unless the suturing is compromised, uh, uh, some like bigger arteries, that's a possibility. If a compromised big artery, or your, your sutures, uh, I use uh, uh, four, like uh, four, two sutures uh, for sickness. But if you use, uh, maybe use uh, not for sickness, maybe there's uh, some possibility you seeing the wall and it may have some dilatation locally. But I don't think we have experienced this kind of issue. Uh, James, this is Randall Wong from Hong Kong. Um, one question is, I noted the use of TEE is mainly um, after, after you deploy the valve to check any prior bubble leak. That's right. And um, so during your alignment, when you move the shift to align the wire mm -hmm. uh, to a coaxial uh, with the aortic with the valve, 
Do you also would check the T normally, or do not just? You no, just do we not don't do it? the T, and the uh, the T probably is more difficult to to see whether this is alignment is good or not. I think a follow is better as long as your projection is a, is a good and is alignment that you, you see it will be a will be a will be a very accurate on the fluoroscopy. So we are not really rely on the T anymore. Uh, in the early days we are we are always trying to look at the T and the flow for the positioning, but nowadays uh, uh, we not really rely on the T at all. The only things I, I want to the two two uh, uh, place ones that you pass the guide wire through the aortic valve, I'd like to have T to confirm the guide wire, make sure it's not through the mitral apparatus because that's the worst complication. Second is basically end of the of the procedure to look at the pellet valve leak. That's only the uh, two places I want to have a T, but otherwise it's not that critical nowadays. All right, thank you. For the apical, for the incision, skin incision at the level of intercostal space, did you um, place your incision based on the preoperative CT, or do you also perform a bet, uh, echo to identify the position of the apex before you choose the correct intercostal space? A uh, good question. This uh, was asked this question the echo or the T or fluoroscopy. And uh, I still uh, prefer the uh, fluoroscopy. I'm not sure we have a recorded uh, imaging initially. Can we have a first image? I, actually, I, I skip that that's a procedure. You, you can see I use a fluoroscopy rather than echoes because the echo sometimes is quite a difficult to identify uh, where the true apex. Uh, so honestly, do you have a, like a put a fluoroscopy like a? So do you before, perform an before. LV gram for that? No, I don't do all of it. Just fluoroscopy. I'm not sure we have a way before. Unfortunately, we don't re uh, record it. But I can show you right now. Can can we have a metal? Okay, so see, I'm done. Adjust the fluoroscopy. Yeah, for. Okay, so I will put it. See, this uh, this is a shadow here. The the is a hard shadow. The right now it's difficult to see because I already opened the chest. But usually you can see this uh, this uh, LV. So I usually use. Uh, see, this is this uh, initially I determined use. Uh, for last way to determine apex. It's pretty uh, accurate. We have been using for more than 10 years, and we still use it. And the same point, cheap, but no, no problems. OK, thank you. Zian, you yeah. have uh, one more question from the floor. Sure. Please. Yes, uh, it's a really, uh, really impressive case. I have uh, one question, the, uh, except, the, except for the making a trans apical access. I think uh, your procedure is uh, straightforward and uh, very simple. So my mm -hmm. question from the, the, in the viewpoint of the, the cardiovascular surgeon, mm -hmm. I think that uh, you have a team with uh, the, uh, Dr. Kim and the Dr. Chu mm -hmm. uh, uh, in a cardiac surgeon. They have actually, they have a lot of uh, experience of the surgery. Yeah, right. I suppose that they, both of them, to do, do uh, such kind of procedure may experience maybe more 10 cases. They will do that without uh, the support of the Cardi interventional cardiologist. What do you think about that? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Uh, I think uh, we are first. Uh, we, we need to emphasize the heart team. So we always uh, like to have a cardiologist and a cardiac surgery in the team. So because uh, I think uh, they are, we have a different uh, expertise, and the cardiologist is very good on the 2D imaging on the screen, and a cardiac surgeon, generally speaking, has a, a less uh, experience uh, watching on the on the screen. So in terms of surgical side, yes, uh, I think uh, Dr. King, Dr. Chu has a lot of experience. Uh, I don't think uh, they have a problem uh, to perform this uh, procedure. And uh, another thing is I think a surgeon, I will emphasize the surgeon need, uh, need to learn the, the, the skills uh, of the wiring. So it's not much uh, really wiring uh, for the transapical. You know, you probably need a, a few cases and to familiar with it. But the most important thing for the surgeon, I just want to say here, I don't know uh, how many surgeons in the audience, very important to learn your eye and it's, uh, you separate your eye from your uh, hands. That's very important. During open heart surgery, your hand, you always, your eyes follow your hand. But if we, for this minimal invasive transcastor procedure, for the surgeon, it has to separate your eye from your finger because that's the first thing you need to learn. Because you do the procedure, you are not watch your finger. You always watch the screen. So I think for the most surgeon, I think this needed to be 
you know, uh, familiar with uh, before the procedure. But I think Dr. Chu does, uh, the King also does the TIVA. So I think if they does the TIVA, I think they'll have uh, this kind of skill. So it's very easy to uh, adopt this procedure. But uh, we will prefer to have also cardiologists here because they also give us the input. Of course, there's not much, uh, you know, things to do, but is it can say epical, actually you can do it by just one person can do it. It's the only thing that one, one, another person need a balloon. Basically, that's it. Uh, it's pretty, you know, if you know it, pretty simple procedure. But I think we should uh, emphasize the heart team. So maybe, Support each uh, other. I'll just add on uh, just a very uh, minor point is that uh, I'm, I'm a surgeon myself and I do see the value of uh, working in a heart team environment. Now the TAVI results getting better and better now and we, every complication has to be fully salvaged. Patient cannot die of uh, complication that you anticipate. So with a heart team I think you have a full capability of able to sort out any complication you, you have on the table. Uh, Things that come to my mind is the valve embolization to park the valve uh, elsewhere, and also coronary obstruction, that you, you need fairly advanced uh, wire skills to wire the coronary to uh, salvage the patient. So I think in a heart team environment, we will have a full complement of uh, all kinds of expertise, wire expertise, surgical expertise, to salvage any kind of complication to get the best results for the patient. I agree. Dr. Zhang has his last question for the question. Or last question? Last yes, question. Uh, this is a great case. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much for your uh, perfect procedures for this uh, important case. Thank you. Well, uh, you have a huge in, uh, experience for transapical TAVI, and the recent report said that uh, transfemoral is growing and uh, catheters uh, decreased uh, every time with, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, manufacturer's uh, research. What is your uh, future perspectives for transapical uh, TAVI? Because, uh, you know, should, uh, I don't know, here, most of uh, attendees here, uh, interventionist or cardiologist, uh, surgeons uh, still like a transapical or transaortic, transaxillary approach in, in patients uh, with uh, excess problem. What is your ex expectation? Thank you. I think a great question. Uh, I think a surgeon always asks this question. Then. Uh, and no doubt the transfemoral will be uh, more and more and more. Then right now it's a, at the us centers probably it's like a 10, 10 to 15 percent will be the transapical and uh, and uh, 85, 90 percent will be a transfemoral. But uh, one thing uh, I just want to uh, to say is uh, transapical. I think uh, at least right now still there's a there's a use for the future is uh, for the mitral valve. I think in the mitral valve, uh, yes, we can do the transeptal, but um, a transapical approach uh, definitely is the uh, easiest way and the safe way uh, for the procedure. Uh, transfemoral is uh, the reason transfemoral pickup is now is, uh, is, uh, is much better than any other uh, approach is it because uh, you can do the procedure without general anesthesia. That's a really, really advantage for the patient recovery and the early discharge. For other procedures, we do need a, a general anesthesia. That's a, that's a problem. Uh, so, but uh, I think a trans aortic, yes, uh, surgeons are trying to do the trans aortic, but uh, in my opinion, trans aortic, there's no really future, no future. The reason is a uh, is, uh, TAVI will be, the, will be performed, as you said, by the transfemoral or trans, trans uh, subclavian on these kinds of when the she's getting smaller. So the trans aortic, there's no rule for the trans aortic to do the TAVI. And the trans apical, because it, the, the future is uh, because the mitral valve still need a trans apical approach. So I think a surgeon should learn the trans apical rather than trans aortic. Uh, this uh, trans aortic, I think in a few years, will be probably not existing. That's my opinion. OK, thank you very much, Jay Jian. Before closing the session, could you show us the final echocardiographic finding? Okay, can we have a, like can we show the echocardiography for the for the pallet valve leak or this kind of? Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is the shoulder axis on the screen. I think uh, pretty good. Mm -hmm. 
I want to hear the echocardiographer's opinion about this finding, right? Okay. okay. Your doctor. Uh, for this patient. Dr. Ho will be given. Okay. Can you? Yeah. So this is a well implanted uh, prosthetic aortic valve, uh, and there is only pinpoint minimal paravalvular leakage on the mm -hmm. anterior side. Mm -hmm. And it is also we can check in. Uh, 135-ish angle. Mm -hmm. and, and for and uh, safety right? concern, it's also no mm -hmm. any significant complication after procedure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, almost time is up for, the, for okay. this session. So give him a big cloud to the team of the Jian's team. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. <laughs> We like to close this session. Thank you very much.